Brewster here, new episode of Brewster's Millions of Rants, and this is the classical influence, and I know I've admitted this in other videos on the channel here, but I love classical music. Actually, I love music. I'm a rock musician, but I'm also big into metal and funk and jazz and acoustic music and Texas swing, and there's a whole bunch of music that really gets me excited and inspired. And definitely, classical music inspires me. It inspires lots of musicians out there. And I thought about this, and technically before I even touched a guitar, before I even heard the band Van Halen and was inspired to play the guitar, you know, long before that, I was a Star Wars kid. You know, grew up playing Star Wars and listening to the soundtrack and stuff. So in a roundabout way, my first musical influence technically was John Williams, you know, the famous film composer. And there's lots of famous, you know, classical composers. You go back hundreds of years. Of course, you have Mozart and Beethoven and Bach and Chopin and people like that. And one thing I want you to think of, which I definitely have thought about this, you know, on the channel here, focusing on lesser known bands and guitarists, but for every big name, you know, classical, you know, composer you've ever heard, for every Mozart or Beethoven that exists, there are hundreds of other classical composers that you've never heard of that kind of filter, you know, below those big names. So in some ways, in this image I'm getting ready to share, these are the big four of classical composers, kind of like the big four of metal. But keep in mind, you know, aside from these famous names, there are literally thousands of classical pieces and composers, you know, throughout history. To bring things closer to the modern age, you have to think of the rock and metal guitarists that are directly influenced by classical musicians and composers. And that includes, of course, Richie Blackmore and Ingve Malmsteen, and like John Roth. I mean, there's tons of players. So here's about 10 players that I created in this image. And I did leave some players out. I didn't mention Nuno or Vinnie Moore. So this isn't a complete, you know, collection of neoclassical rock and metal guitarists, but it is a good sample of some pioneers and those early, you know, furious guitarists that were whipping out all these classical ideas on an electric guitar with distortion, you know, through a Marshall stack or whatever. But here's the legends of neoclassical rock and metal. And one more thing before we jump in, I have featured a lot of classical music on the channel here. There's a classical guitar primer, the classical side of Alex Lifeson, the classical side of Randy Rhodes, the classical side of Ingve Malmsteen, and there's Paul Gilbert lessons, Ingve lessons, all sorts of stuff that kind of surrounds this classical, you know, theme, idea, uh, you know, textures and all this stuff that you hear in music. But uh, there's actually a movie that I recommend to my students all the time. It's from 1984. It's Amadeus, you know, a very famous, you know, movie. It won like eight Academy Awards and a Grammy and all this stuff. So it was a very celebrated film in 1984. But I love that film. It inspires me musically. And there's a specific scene when uh, Salieri, you know, writes a, a piece for Mozart and he welcomes him, you know, to the kingdom where he lives. And he's playing the piece as Mozart enters, you know, the castle and stuff. And then at the end, he tries to hand them, you know, the, the manuscript paper, like the sheet music. And Mozart's like, no, I don't need that. It's all up here. And all the kings and all the people are like, you know, whatever, and they can't believe it. So they say, all right, prove it. And then Mo Mozart sits down, starts playing the piece, you know, the Salieri, you know, composed. And then he starts to improvise and starts stretching out. And he's like, yeah, that doesn't really work. And then he just starts going crazy right there, like at a piano or a harpsichord. And I love that scene. And I remember when I was a kid and I saw that movie, when that scene happened, I thought, man, I want to be like Mozart. I want to be a badass like that. And that scene still, you know, it just inspires me where it's like, wow, even though it's a Hollywood film, that's actually based on a true, you know, historical story. With the opening, that's Mozart's Symphony Number no. 25 in G minor, a very famous, you know, Mozart piece. And it actually is featured in the movie Amadeus uh, quite a bit. But uh, this definitely, you know, it's tailor-made for hard rock or metal guitar. You can hear it where it's like, wow, you play on the guitar with distortion, and it sounds like, you know, something modern or something, you know, authentically hard rock or metal. But then you turn it back over to a, you know, symphonic orchestra, and it sounds like Mozart. But it's something like this. <laughs> So we're basically in G minor right there. 
And if you have your ears on, you can definitely hear there's a dark tonality, very common tonality. We've talked a lot on this channel about harmonic minor, and that's kind of what's happening there. It's flirting with G harmonic minor. So it starts with this uh, G octave right here, and you're just playing octaves, you know, in that opening. So it's G to G. And you could pick that. You could also hybrid pick it. If you don't really want to pick, you know, across the strings, you could hybrid pick. And then you're going to move from G to D and do a D octave right there, D to D. Now it's the flat six, it's E flat right here. And then the raised seventh, which is signaling, you know, G harmonic minor. There's F sharp right there. So with that series of four octaves, Mozart literally kind of served up, you know, G harmonic minor on a platter like that. signaling that tonality of G harmonic minor, but he's doing it with octaves. And then right here, it's basically a G minor arpeggio. And right there you can see we're moving up G minor, he's also grabbing the second, that A, and then he's grabbing G F sharp, which is the raised seventh for harmonic minor and then back to that G. You're doing that G minor. And you wanna do that twice in a row. And that last half is, you know, furious in there. That first part is just kind of flowing and then it's busy at the end. Like that. And then you're gonna do... Think of that a couple different ways. I'm thinking of that as F sharp diminished right there. You could also think of that as like an A minor flat six, kind of, I guess, or A minor, A minor six. So you're gonna move up there. And you're kind of mimicking that first pattern. But you're doing it right here. Definitely a demanding, you know, a fingering for your fret hand. And then right here, it's back to G minor, but you're starting on that B flat. So right there, you're coming up. And you're going to catch that F sharp. And then right here, it converts back to G Aeolian or natural minor. goes back to that F sharp to D, so it's kind of flirting back with that, uh, you know, D dominant, signaling once again harmonic minor right at the very end of that phrase. You're kind of waiting there like a cherry on top right there. But that's really cool to bring an open electric guitar, play it with distortion, and start rocking out with some Mozart. So if we dive down in the trenches and really reveal what's going on there in that piece, you know, we're kind of weaving between G Aeolian and G Harmonic Minor, and it's kind of flirting or playing with your ear as it moves along. So we're definitely in G Minor. And what I want you to do for this is I'm really just going to take a one octave, you know, fragment of G Aeolian or G Natural Minor, and we're going to kind of play, you know, between Harmonic Minor and Aeolian. So we could do this. <laughs> But that's not really the fingering I want to use. I want to use this fingering. So it's kind of a modified Aeolian fingering. But there's your G, A, B flat, C, D, E flat, F, and G for G Aeolian. And what I want you to do is grab the highest note, that high G, then grab the lower G, and then ascend through that scale like this. It's really giving you an earful of G Aeolian because you're hearing the highest note and then you're climbing all the way through that scale and returning that note again. 
Let's do it the other way. You could actually, you know, grab uh, the lowest note, then the highest note, and then descend the scale. Right? So ascend or descend. Right, but that's Aeolian, right? G A B flat, C D E flat, F G. Now to change that to harmonic minor, all we have to do is just convert the seventh from a regular seventh to a sharp seven, or raised seventh. And that's going to be F sharp right here. Very distinct sound. I mean, definitely Yngwie hangs on those notes a lot, I mean, bending and stuff. But you can distinctly hear that, you know, shift from Aeolian to harmonic minor. It's very distinct. And let's do that same thing. Grab the highest note and then ascend G harmonic minor. And then do it the other way. Um, you know, you can grab the lowest note and then descend G harmonic minor. that difference between Aeolian and harmonic minor. So it's going to be nearly impossible for me to sum up hundreds and hundreds of years of classical music, you know, here in a 20 minute video or whatever. So I'm really just going to hit some different things and kind of throw out some different ideas and really just kind of get the ball rolling or get the topic started here. And I definitely have plans of creating more lessons like this where we're looking at you know, classical pieces on guitar, or maybe famous examples of songs that borrow, you know, classical themes, melodies, and stuff like that, and rock and hard rock and metal music. But anyway, next we're going to look at pedal point ideas, and this definitely comes from the Baroque period. Bach and Handel and players like that and composers like that use pedal point and trills and stuff a lot in their compositions and in their music. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that same, you know, pocket of notes that we just had for Aeolian and harmonic minor in the key of G, you know, this. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to go back to, you know, that original fingering I mentioned just briefly before we changed it to this alternate fingering. But we're going to basically do the pedal point like this. One more time. And right there you can see we're actually using that octave. And then the pedal point is actually that high G right there, because we're going to basically walk down the scale. And we're really just alternating between that high G and then, you know, alternating every other note with the rest of the notes in that scale. So there's F to G, E flat to G. I'm grabbing the D right there. There's the C, B flat. There's the A right there, and then end on G. Very distinct Ingve uses pedal point a lot. Now let's convert that to harmonic minor. So instead of the F, now play F sharp and keep everything else the same. You know, immediately it has the sinister, you know, darker edge. Play around with those pedal point ideas like that. There's Aeolian and then harmonic minor. Very cool sound, and you can find lots of players. Ingve, technically Steve Morris, Eric Johnson. There's a ton of players that use pedal point in their music. Definitely caught some guitarists out there using tapping to create and produce some of these pedal point sounds on the guitar. And this first idea is really just a basic demonstration, and then I have a little etude you can practice that's extended. And this is definitely going to produce Bach-isms, or Bach-influenced you know, sounds. It definitely sounds like some of his organ you know, pieces, or fugues, or whatever. But uh, the basic idea is like this. One more time. And we're still in G minor, technically, right there. And I'm using this D note as the pedal point, and then descending notes from G harmonic minor, technically. So I'm tapping D and releasing to C, tapping that D, releasing to B flat, tapping the D, releasing to A, tap the D, release to G, tap the D, return to that B flat, 
tap the D, return to A, tap the D, return to G, tap the D, play F sharp, which is going to imply G harmonic minor, tap the D one more time and end on G. So I know that's a lot of explanation just to you know describe this. But that's basically what's happening. That D note just keeps you know sounding and being played in the middle of all those scale tones. Now the extended etude is something like this. the same way, like this. So right there, we do that descending the same way. I get all the way down to that F sharp, and then when I do that final little pass, you go to the open D right here. And then... That's where you're going to start climbing back up again. Get that E. Right there. And then do all that again. Right there, it's going to change. We're going to grab this E flat, and you're going to descend. like this crazy Bach at two. things up here we're going to take a look at Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 5 or Beethoven's 5th and actually Ace Frehley used to play this live you know in KISS shows but and I think we actually talked about that in the uh, USB Ace Frehley mystery you know from last October but anyway uh, Beethoven's 5th crank up the distortion and play it aggressively like a hard rock or metal tune and it's tailor-made for the guitar like this <laughs> that and all sorts of stuff and definitely you can find guitarists playing it too but when you start that initial riff I'm just thinking power chords right there G5 to an E flat 5 over B flat right there to get that heavy demon sound and then do F and then you're gonna go to a D5 over A right there G5 three times to that E flat over B flat, and then F5 uh, three times to D5 over A, and that's that famous opening on the guitar. And then you basically hear this. It's a melodic line, and we're technically in C minor for this. And it starts with. flat, A flat to G, E flat to C right there for that first little melodic line. And then G to D, A flat to G. And right there, this F to D. So it's kind of answering that first melody. And then you hear this uh, G, G, F, E flat. First time like that, like a stretch. And I did a bend. And then the last time, you hear that G G F, and then an E flat five power chord to a C power chord to a G power chord or G five. And then you hear that answered with A flat to F. Right? Super ominous. I mean, it sounds like a Sabbath riff or something right there. Um, or Metallica or who 
whoever. But that's really cool, you know, transfer to the electric guitar, pump up some distortion. Definitely, you know, Beethoven can hear that. He's probably approving, like, yeah, that sounds, you know, it sounds like the way I wrote it. episode of Brewster's Millions of Rants with the classical influence and I do have plans to create more episodes you know kind of centered around this idea or this basic theme because there's lots and lots you can pull from classical music and bring it over into rock or hard rock or metal or other styles of music jazz or fusion or whatever um, you could bring it over in some funk I don't know what classical funk would sound like I bet it would sound kind of cool but uh, the interesting thing here is you're just kind of playing with music. You're bringing music from other styles or other instruments over to the guitar, translating it and transferring it to this instrument. And I love doing this. I love you know learning things from cello or piano or violin or a saxophone or whatever and adapting it and bringing it over to the guitar and trying to make sense of it, you know, with six strings and however many frets I have. So uh, 22, you know, on most of my guitars. But... Uh, but anyway, it's just really interesting, it's eye-opening, it's inspiring. It definitely puts, you know, a fire into your butt to try something different. You know, maybe open a different door, expose yourself to some different music, think outside the box, take some chances. You know, if you hear some melodic, you know, theme or something from a movie or on a commercial or whatever, and if it catches your ear and you're like, hey, I like that, then learn it. You know, it could be a theme from Star Wars, it could be Chopin, it could be Yngwie, it could be whoever. But you're using your ear, you're using your imagination and your musical mind and trying something different. And who knows? I mean, you might write a song. You might, you know, dive into classical music for years and study it. You might start taking classical guitar lessons. And you can definitely open up lots of new worlds and ideas in your music. So anyway, leave some feedback and comments. Please subscribe to my lessons and I'll be back before you know it with more content and material. Thank you.